Well, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us once again on Footy School. It's been a while since we've heard your voice on the podcast. Yeah, it's great to be back and uh, thank you for inviting me. Not a problem at all. The pleasure's ours. So we're going to be looking at one of your pieces today, Variations on Vas Lebet. And my first question about the piece would be, what was the inspiration to write this major work? Well, I had it in my mind uh, for a while um, to write a set of variations. Um, And I've always admired the writing of Ken Downey in particular and um, Edward Gregson's Laudate Dominum, which is, of course, one of the classics of the genre. Um, So I I had an ambition to write a piece like that. I'd never written a set of variations before. Um, So it was sort of stewing in my mind for a while. Um, And the tune Vas Lebet um, had also been in my mind for quite some time. Um, because I saw a lot of possibility with, with that tune that, that could lend itself to a set of variations. So what can you tell us about the tune Vas Lebet, if indeed I am actually pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, I think that's actually correct. Um, well, it's actually an epiphany hymn that was written by John Samuel Bewley Monzel. That's a bit of a mount, mouthful. Um, for his Hymns of Love and Praise book, which was published in 1863, I believe. Uh, the first line is actually taken from First Chronicles 16.29 um, and also from the Psalms. Uh, the remainder of the, v- the first verse tells of the wise men worshipping the infant Jesus um, in Matthew 2. And the Psalms are also referenced in verses 2, 3 and 4. Uh, the first verse is actually usually repeated at the end. Uh, the actual tune Vos Lebet comes from a German manuscript of 1754, um, where it accompanies the song Vas Lebet, Vas Schwebet. I um, hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, and the manuscript contains many tunes not found elsewhere, and they're, they're possibly arrangements of traditional songs. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that background. And you mentioned that this piece, you saw a lot of opportunities in the music uh, and why you wanted to use it. What in particular was it about the melody that stood out and uh, gripped you? Well, there were a few inspirations, really. Uh, for some time, I'd had the tune Vas Lebet in my mind, probably through singing it on a Sunday morning at the core. And very often, that's where the idea for a new piece comes from. I also have an affinity with the variations form, and it had been an ambition of mine to write a set of variations. Although I've written a few now, Vas Lebet was actually my first. Somehow, the tune kept coming back to me and went around in my head in various guises. And that told me that there was probably a larger scale piece in there somewhere. Having decided to embark on the piece, I did a lot of listening to classics of the genre and took a lot from the process. So I suppose you could say this piece is a combination of that. I tend to think that you're a product of everything you listen to. So whether you know it or not, when you write a piece, you're you're sure to have been influenced by something. In this particular piece, I think you can hear a wide range of influences. And just to put a timeline and a scale on it for our listeners, how long roughly did it take you from the initial uh, concept to the idea to completing writing the piece? It, it took the best part of a year, actually, uh, with a break in between. Um, so I had, I had two or three months off in the summer. I was working um, for the Salvation Army at that time in the music department here in Texas. Um, so we had a summer camp and obviously you don't get a lot of time to write. So it gave me a bit of a break in between. I got back to it after that. Um, and I, I actually got to hear it for the first time at our Territorial Music Institute um, at Camp Hoblitzell here in Texas. Um, every, every year they have a reading session, which is quite useful for um, aspiring composers because you get to hear a piece for the first time. And uh, anyone who wants to comes along and they play in the band. Um, uh, and, and so um, this is one of the pieces that was played that year. Um, and I think I'd written maybe three of the variations by then. And, and the bandmaster that year, the, the special guest was actually John Lamb. Uh, So he conducted the band for that. So I know certainly that playing the piece here uh, with several different bands is a real instant hit. Uh, Was it the same and received very well in its first performance when you heard it then? I guess you could say it was hard to judge from a player's or listener's point of view because typically you only get one rundown in these reading sessions and it's late at night when everyone's had a long day. So it was probably only after the piece started to get performed that I received feedback, which has largely been positive, I'm pleased to say. From what I recall, it was first played at the UK's Territorial Music School um, and also the Northern Summer School, I think, before it, before it was actually published. Uh, and then soon after that by the ISB and Enfield. 
I was I was also sent recordings of each of these performances, so it was good to hear various interpretations. More recently, it was actually selected as a set test for the Swiss National Second Section. I, I'm just grateful when any band plays my music, so to see this piece pop up in various parts of the world is really quite humbling. Fantastic. So I think now would be a good time to head into the score and take a bit of a delve and go through section by section. Um, I think before we look at the introduction, though, it might be interesting just to talk about the structure of the piece, which will help us to navigate our way through it. So could you just briefly tell us a little bit about the structure of the piece before we go into detail? Yes, well, we have uh, an extended introduction, uh, which leads into five contrasting variations. So that's the overall structure. Fantastic. So, should we look at that introduction first of all? And it's a all guns blazing start, isn't it? Absolutely. So we've got fanfare cornets, um, and we have uh, these accented semiquavers based on rising fourths which is actually an inversion of the first two notes of the tune. Uh, underneath that and answering that, we have organ-like chords uh, with, with added uh, fists in the bass. Uh, and we also have a statement of the dotted rhythmic motif that we'll hear a great deal of uh, throughout the work. I, I picture this introduction being played in a vast cathedral, actually. Um, now, throughout the introduction, we'll hear snippets of the tune. Um, it's introducing the listener to, to what to listen out for later. What we don't have, like some variations, such as you know Prince Thorpe and St Magnus, for example, is a full statement of the tune. In fact, we never hear the full tune until the very end. Um, so I kind of see it like a picture that's never fully in focus. Uh, you have hints of it being in focus at times, but it's never fully revealed until the very end. Fantastic. And after the music reaches a grand climax, just before A, uh, it softens a little bit. Would you like to talk us through what uh, was in, going through your mind in the inspiration for letter A, please? Yes, well, I think we've had the all guns blazing here um, and this, this sort of impactful introduction. And I think we need some contrast here and, and just some dying away. And we, we go to the mellow um, part of the band, so you've got horns, baritones, euphoniums, basses uh, carrying the melody here. Um, and then after that we return um, to, to the kind of blazing fanfare again. Letter B sees us enter variation number one. What was your inspiration for this first variation? Well, I'm quite inspired by classical music, um, especially in my, my old age now. I listen to a lot more uh, classical music than I used to. Um, and I can, uh, so I'd, I would say the music is very classical in approach, uh, particularly this movement, the first variation. Uh, you can almost imagine it being played by strings. Um, I, I'd say a lot of my brass band music is actually quite symphonic in approach. Um, it, it's, uh, it's in the minor key mainly. Of course, the original tune is in the major key, uh, but this particular variation is largely in the minor key. Um, and right from the off, we have a reference to the tune in, in the staccato quavers in, in the horns. Da, 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 you know, that, that rising figure. I'd say the energy comes from a regular contrast between the, the cantabile references to the theme set against lively staccato figures. Uh, as snippets of the chorale come and go with the last phrase of the hymn completing the movement. Let us see we have a more extended passage based on the rising theme. Uh, it's an interesting combination of instruments that, that carry the, the tune here. So first cornet, horns and euphonium. So the cornets are in the lower register 
uh, horns in the mid register and euphoniums in the high register. So this combination of instruments in different registers creates an interesting timbre. <laughs> theme is continued but in the trombones in octaves which gives quite a, si a sinister timbre I think. Uh, and we've got this bass rhythm underpinning it which is also irregular and unpredictable which creates a sense of instability. Moving on to E the melody transfers to the bass, uh, and we have some contrapuntal activity in the accompaniment above it. There's a fair amount of contrary motion in these parts with the baritones going up and cornets going down scale-wise. Um, and I've always thought this is the foundation of good voice leading as opposed to parallel motion. To end the movement, we have an emphatic statement of the, uh, the end of the chorale in the relative major, which gives it a sense of resolution, I think. very very well orchestrated uh, and a good idiomatic use of all the, the instruments here in the school. Who are some of your inspirations when it comes to brass band orchestration? Um, for this particular work I would say there's certainly influences of Ken Downey, Kevin Norbury, Eric Gregson, Philip Wilby, Eric Sarty even and someone's even said Michael Jackson <laughs> for, <laughs> for one of the movements so you, you'll probably hear that later. Um, but I only realised that afterwards that actually, <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of smooth criminal in, in there, believe it or not. <laughs> nice, you'll definitely have to point that out when we get there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that takes us on to the second variation. How does this contrast the first variation? So after all the activity and busyness of the first variation, the second variation is melancholy and restful, I'd say. Uh, we've also had a lot of loud music until this point, so I think it's important the listeners' ears are given a rest. I had in my mind the words of the second verse when I write this movement. Um, so the words of which are, Low at his feet lay your burden of carefulness. High on his heart he will bear it for you. Guiding your sorrows and answer it your prayerfulness. Guiding your steps in the way that is true. And there's definitely a sense of yearning about the music here. Uh, there's a fair amount of tension in the harmony, which for me refers to the sorrows uh, that it talks about in this verse. Uh, for example, the use of the major sevenths, which, which grind against the otherwise tonal harmony. And the mellow instruments are featured more than the brights for much of this movement. For instance, the, the flugel, horns, baritones, euphoniums and basses. At letter J, the music opens up and becomes quite expansive and emotive. In terms of the motifs, uh, the first two notes of the tune are turned upside down, so we have a falling rather than rising fifth. The movement ends with a sense of dying away. I, I guess it could have been marked morendo, which would have been appropriate for what's happening here. So we have this dotted rhythm repeated several times as it fades to a pian pianissimo chord, which brings some form of resolution for now.
So after that fragility of variation two, we enter some angst and agitation with the third variation. do and uh, I'd say the music quite quirky and volatile here um, and it takes its inspiration from the third and fourth verses of the of the tune which describe the fearful times in life that we must entrust to the Lord. Uh, there's probably elements of Shostakovich in here actually as well in terms of the, the musical content. The rhythm is driven by the percussion and the bass section in particular with ostinato figures. Uh, there, are, there are references to variation one as well with its chorale-like figures and hurtling scalic figures, and it's generally quite abrasive, as, as you say. At letter N, we have a, a quasi-fugue. By that, I mean we, we have various voices entering with the theme at various times, but it doesn't follow the traditional form of a, a fugue, as it's soon interrupted by the chorale. Uh, the real fugue will, will come later in the fifth variation. So you mentioned there's a little hint of a fugue there. At this point in the writing process, did you know that the final movement was going to take a fugue? Was this a deliberate reference? Yes, um, it was. And in fact, I don't believe that I wrote the piece chronologically. Um, So I think I started the fifth variation quite early on and and possibly the second variation, Um, but the rest followed. Um, I think it's John Williams, the film composer, that said it, it often helps to, to start writing pieces at the end and then you can work your way through because you, you have an idea of where the music's going, going to finish up. Um, so I think that was the case here. <laughs> Can you tell us about some of the textures that you're exploring in this movement? Yes, I think in a piece of music of this scale it it pays to vary the texture where possible, otherwise things become rather monotonous after a while. This particular movement is built on a fair amount of contrapuntal music or polyphony where we have two or more simultaneous melodic lines. To me this is perhaps the most challenging kind of music to write but at the same time I think it's probably the most interesting to listen to. If you glance through the score, there there isn't really anywhere where there isn't some kind of movement in one part or another. So very often if one part is holding a note, something rhythmic is happening elsewhere to carry the momentum forward. Added to that, we also have the use of straight mutes in cornets and trombones, which creates another subset of instruments, I think, and gives us a variance in colour. Towards the end of the movement, the music dies down somewhat, not in terms of tempo, but in the reduction of instruments, which thins the texture out. And we also have a lowering of the dynamics. It also closes in the minor key, which to me suggests a sense of our completeness in Christ is yet to be resolved. So that takes us on to the fourth variation. Where did your inspiration come from and what were you trying to depict in this movement? Well, there's very much a French romantic feel to this movement. I'm quite inspired by the romantic period in general. Um, I I don't know that I was listening to any particular music at that time that this represents, but uh, with with so many things in composition, it's subconscious, I think. An idea comes to mind and it was somehow based on the theme. Um, But but there was an idea to start with a horn solo. Um, And actually it carries it through for for several bars um, before the, the melody is taken on by various other soloists around the band. Uh, the texture in this section is a lot lighter uh, than previously, uh, after the intensity of variation three. Um, and I think it's important that there's some breathing space in the score. Uh, you, again, you can imagine it being, being played by a chamber string orchestra, I think. There's a lot of quasi pizzicato um, and it's really quite playful. Uh, There's also an underlying sense of humour to it, I think. Uh, Probably more so than any of the other movements, for sure. Uh, As I said, we have a few solos thrown around the band. So we start with solo horn, um, euphonium, flugel, soprano, cornet and trombone all take up the the, the tune at various times. The harmony uh, is quite chromatic at times. 
um, which I guess is um, representative of the, the French Romantic style. Uh, but we even have the whole tone scale thrown in, in in a couple of places, which I guess is quite unusual for Salvation Army music. So after that soothing balm, uh, we yet once again enter a slightly more frantic variation, the fifth variation, where we have the fugue. Can you tell us about how you went about creating this melody that worked as a fugue motif? I found it quite challenging writing a fugue. Uh, I'd never written one before. Uh, and of course, you have to obey all the rules for it to work correctly. Otherwise, it just doesn't pan out. Um, so it took a lot of refining to get the lines exactly right so that they would overlap with each other. Um, so it is a fugue in the traditional sense, um, in that we have a subject, an answer, and then several episodes. So we start with the solar cornice with the subject, uh, then the horns enter down a fifth as the answer, followed by the basses and euphoniums, and finally the baritones with the horns at letter Z. have the subject in, in the bass in augmentation and above that the rest of the band is jumping around with various strains of the theme. It's at this point that we come to the finale and this is the first time that the tune is presented in its entirety. And what sort of emotion uh, were you trying to find with your harmonisation and interpretation of that first presentation of the melody at CC? Well we've, we've had the tune earlier in the minor key um, never in its full form, as you say. So I think it's, it's very much a, a majestic arrival here. Um, again, you can imagine this being played in a big cathedral. That was what I was picturing in my mind. Um, and we have the chorale with the tune um, in the, the, the back row cornets, the flugelhorn and the upper horns. But we also have a decoration figure, so a continuation of, of the the theme from the fugue here in the soprano, solo corn, it's a euphonium. Was it on your mind the any word painting or reference to the words as you were writing and harmonising this section? I think the words are very important here. And as I said earlier on, the last verse of the hymn contained the same words as the first verse. Um, so they read, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, bow down before him, his glory proclaim. With gold of obedience and incense of lowliness, kneel and adore him, the Lord is his name. Uh, and that picture of kneeling and adoring is such a powerful one, isn't it? H here we are bowing down to our creator, the one who made all things. So naturally the music is very majestic and the chords are rich and full. We also have a walking bass line at, at double D, which gives a sense of power and strength, I think. 
the blazing fanfares at the end of the work, which, which lead into the final few bars, also elicit this sense of grandeur and majesty. Is there some deliberate symmetry between the opening motifs and the ending here? Very much so. I think um, you definitely hear that fanfare figure which, which returns and it, it, it helps bring the piece to a conclusion that there's that reassurance of our com- completeness in the Lord, I think, here. And I'd be interested to know, how much did this piece evolve and change over the period from your writing to its eventual publication? Well, not many people know this, but the published version is actually shorter than the original, as there was actually a second statement of the big tune at the end. Um, I talked to Stephen Cobb about the piece, and he felt it would be too much of a challenge stamina-wise for most bands to have that that second presentation of the tune. Um, And uh, I I think the piece is probably long enough already, but that that particular presentation that wasn't published was an even grander version with... um, thicker chords that re- refer more to the introduction. Um, and I quite liked it, but um, I, I tend to agree with Steve that for most bands, it would be a bit of a push to, to pull that off. That's really interesting. Not something I knew. So thank you for sharing that little inside knowledge. Yeah. Uh, so for anyone looking at the score or listening to the music, you can, you can see there's a lot of percussion here in this uh, build up to the ending. Why was the use of percussion so important at this moment in particular? Well, I think if you looked at the score up until this point, I'm, I'm quite sparing in the use of percussion. Um, and I think this is one of the, the techniques that, that brings this sense of finality to it. Um, you know, we've got all guns blazing in the percussion here. We've got the timps rolling. We've got the tubular bells. Uh, we've got clash cymbal as well and suspended cymbal um, rolling into the ending. Um, it, and it goes back to, to this scene of a cathedral, I think, with the tubular bells. Um, pounding away there. My mother-in-law always jokes that I, I managed to get these into every piece. Um, so, and so it is the case here, but I think it was quite appropriate for this piece in particular. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us and to give us an insight into this epic work. But thank you for giving us a a little tour through the music and your thought process there. And thank you again for giving up your time to join us. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure and I I love the podcast. I listen every month. um, So keep up the good work.